Welcome everyone to our focus on the spectrum of purpose. My name is Joseph Press, co-author of Office Shock, which we launched actually here on LinkedIn Live last Tuesday. And we had said that to give everyone the opportunity to go into more depth into the spectrums, the spectrums of choice, the spectrums that we believe are important for all leaders, organizations, and even communities to consider to navigate through Office Shock towards better futures for working and living. And today I'm really excited and honored to have Professor Lonnie Brooks with us, in addition to my co-author, Bob Johansson. Lonnie is a professor of communications at Cal State uh, and he is a co-founder of Afro Rhythms. He originally uh, grew up in Los Angeles, and he has Jewish, Ukrainian, Black, and Native American background. So we're really excited to be able to hear, Lonnie, your perspectives coming from those different cultures and histories about what is the future of purpose? There's a lot of buzz around this word purpose. So I'm really excited to be able to unpack that with you and try to make things a little bit more tangible as we look at what future, what next, those signals of that future. And hopefully we're going to have the time to also talk about some choices about what now to be able to bring that future of more purpose closer to the present. Before we get to that, though, I really want to, uh, again, thank Bob for joining us today. And this is such an important opportunity because of Bob's many years of work at the Institute, his many books. So, Bob, I wanted to give you the opportunity to help frame up this conversation about the spectrum of purpose. Sure. Happy to do that, Joseph. And an office shock is abrupt unsettling change in how, where, when, and, and even why, even why we work. And we're giving a future back view. I think the first future back view from 10 years ahead. And we are not here to tell people what to do. We're here to give you a framework, a future back framework to help you make choices about how, when, where, and even a bit of why, uh, why you work. These seven spectrums of choice, which we introduced last week, uh, begin with purpose. Um, and we think this should happen in order. So we, we're so happy to have Lonnie here with us for the first one. I first met Lonnie 25 years ago when he was studying us at Institute for the Future. He was a PhD student at USC, and he's now a full professor. Um, and we've stayed in touch over the years. He reviewed this book and gave some very important input to it. But this is the first spectrum of choice. So where many people are saying, when do we go back to the office? Um, we're saying, well, that's a good question. But for us, it's number six out of seven. The first question is, why an office at all? What's the purpose? What's the intent? And that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, we move in the seven spectrums, and we'll have separate sessions here on outcomes, on climate impact on belonging, and there's many links to what Lonnie's gonna talk about between purpose and belonging. We then talk about augmentation. There's even links between what Lonnie's talking about and augmentation and virtual reality. Then we get to place and time. And then finally, agility will be our last session. How do we pull all that together? How do we create an agile, an agile workforce? But Lonnie, it's great to be with you again, and uh, we're so excited that you get to begin the conversation and we get to learn from you. It's great to be here uh, too, and, and thanks, Bob. Um, and, and a shout out to my alma mater, my graduate school at UC San Diego, um, where I got that PhD. Because because Sorry, I got that slightly wrong. Okay, please, no, thanks okay. for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Bruin too at UCLA, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but, but yes, you know, um, you know, part of the purpose reminds me of something I was talking about with um, the co-founder of um, the Afro Rhythm Futures Group with Ahmed Best, and he talked about um, the third principle of Kwanzaa as being Ujima, collective work and responsibility. And so I really um, 
am inspired by that because when we talk about future back, you know, part of my, you know, what wakes me up in the morning is thinking of a Star Trek universe, you know, a federation where we have an abundance of wealth and can kind of choose um, how we want to, you know, maximize uh, our abilities in life, you know, and when I think about that too, I also think about my ancestry and where I've come from and where Afrofuturism in terms of trying to recover the undiscovered stories. And I mean, this might be a good time to, to, to show one slide uh, too, um, where, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, noted sociologist um, in the 19th and, and early 20th centuries, he, he was also a science fiction uh, writer and he wrote a novel called The Prince of Steel. And in it, he created an instrument called the Megascope, a fictional instrument where it was about finding the undiscovered stories of our um, of the Black diaspora and, and Indigenous peoples. Um, because one thing that motivates me too is understanding that the, that the Black slaves that came from Africa, it's like a science fiction horror story where they come from West Africa as, as slaves and were kidnapped in the millions and with the latest in surveillance and bondage technologies taken across a vast interstellar Atlantic Sea. And when they arrive in the Americas, um, you know, they could be killed for practicing their language or, um, or playing their music or practicing their religion. And so um, with Christi Christianity imposed upon them, they created, they adopted Christian hymnals and transformed them into spirituals, visions of a liberated land that they called Zion. And, you know, this in turn, if we go to the next slide, this is what scholars call sonic utopias. It's our cultural vibranium that then transforms into jazz, rock, hip hop, um, trap music, and it infuses every genre on the planet with um, visions of a black future. So this is what I call our ancestral intelligence and what in the black diaspora is known as the mothership the mother load of ancestral intelligence that, you know, sometimes I call it the real AI because this is where we discover how the black diaspora has had to become hybrid futurists in an alien world. And I think when I think about that, I think of ways that the cosmo, you know, former cosmologies of indigenous peoples and the black diaspora can actually serve us in healing the planet and healing climate change and thinking about alternative ways of being that can actually heal the world. And, you know, that brings me back to Ujima. Um, and also thinking about ways that we're bringing that and augmenting the future with that ancestral intelligence. So the Afro-Rhythm Futures Group works with um, a virtual reality company called Origami Air and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, um, where we've collaborated on building a town called Afterville that always takes place eight years in the future. But they've, they've also given us our own um, airship um, in virtual reality called uh, the Air Aphorism, which has become a hub for Afrofuturism um, and that we're making into a hub for Afrofuturism. So we're exhibiting um, images from local artists in Oakland, um, like Name Brown, and also translating our forecasting game, Aphorisms for the Future, into virtual reality. So we're, you know, as a signal, we're trying to think of how do we create more of a pluriverse of purpose in virtual reality um, versus, you know, just what we call them, you know, the metaverse, because metaverse is actually a dystopian term from Neil Stevenson. So how can we flip it and create um, a real virtual space that articulates everyone's purpose and vision for alternative futures? And so that's really important to me as a signal. And um, so we, you know, we just convened, uh, we're creating what we call the Afro Egalitarian Virtual Nation, a safe hub for Africana and indigenous peoples. And we just had our first convening at the Interval Bar um, thanks to the Long Now Foundation, uh, who gave us a great rate <laughs> on the Sunday that we held. And this is our group. We brought together neuroscientists, policymakers, uh, social scientists, 
to really think about that future um, of creating a pluriverse um, that's based on anti-racist principles and for really augmenting and leveraging our ancestral intelligence. So, you know, um, if you go to the next slide, you can see me taking a tour of, in, or well, actually that's a, that's a great view too of us playing the game, Afro-Rhythms from the Future. Um, such a great group. And, and then that's a, when I was doing a tour of our virtual reality airship, the air Afro rhythm. But, you know, I think more to the point, if we think about these signals for the future, um, we we're also experimenting with AI tools, like as many people are. But, you know, something I didn't realize, and what's interesting to me, that um, Joe Unger, uh, the, the co founder of the Origami um, Virtual Reality Company, Origami Air, he was telling me how, you know, there's this new term that's coming about as when we're talking about AI tools like chat GPT-3, you know, it's more about kind of creating AI ambassadors or AI companions where these threads that you create, they're like little brains that you have to train and that they can actually, you know, I'm actually experimenting with creating a chat GPT-3 thread that imbues the knowledge of the mothership of ancestral intelligence to become its own character. You know, what would that be like? And you have to, you have to actually feed it knowledge and grow this personality of the AI. It's, so these are like little brains and you, you have to make sure that you're saving your thread <laughs> so you don't lose everything. But I see this as a, as a harbinger of things to come where people can have um, AI companions as multiple facets of their personalities and purposes in, in the journey. So, you know, maybe AI isn't here to terminate us, to replace us, but actually amplify our purpose um, and our, our personalities in life and facets of who we are. So I think, you know, if we go back to thinking about Douglas Rushkoff and being team human, I think AI is, is one of those that we kind of um, bring into the fold of team human rather than it you know, mindlessly replacing us. We imbue it with what I say, more ancestral intelligence, more African and indigenous soul. And, uh, you know, that's what, why I like to get up in the morning and play with these uh, new technologies uh, and emerging technologies, right? So I really come back to that. And then when we think about, well, um, the UN sustainable goals of decent work, reducing inequalities, um, gender equality, it really comes together in that sense of a shared purpose. Um, you know, I really, I really want this virtual reality to be a pluriverse, not a metaverse. <laughs> and I want AI to be uh, an extension of myself, not a replacement for who I am. So that's how I've been thinking about purpose lately. Fantastic, uh, Ronnie, and so much there. We've got uh, yeah a lot of uh, very interesting signals that you've brought in and also the actual work that you're doing on the ground, particularly with those last slides uh, showing the work of Afrofutures. I'd like to put all that just uh, to the side for a couple of minutes just to dig deeper into the connection between ancestral intelligence and collective purpose. Kind of unpack that uh, because there's something very rich in what you've described about ancestral intelligence. Uh, and if we can make it clear, what are the connections to purpose and particularly collective purpose, I think it'll also put into context those very exciting signals for how, what that future of more shared purpose might look like. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in rec recovering ancestral intelligence, um, it's really about finding those undiscovered stories. So if you think about um, examples, like if you've seen the film Hidden Figures, uh, where we had Black women astronauts, or Black women mathematicians, that is, engineers, um, computer scientists, uh, actually charting the trajectory into space for white astronauts in the 1960s. Um, that 
is a story that not many of us had heard until recently, unless you had read the book. And that's an example of something that I call Afro-future tropes or Afro-future types. It's, it's this embodiment of a simultaneous ascension of purpose and erasure of it in the African, in the Black diaspora history. So how do we recover these stories that can actually give people more agency around their futures? You know, um, so that's something that I think is really important to find those examples of these undiscovered stories, like the Black Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Um, just as a, a second generation out from slavery, and that was the Black, Black Wall Street that was coming to the, to the fore in Oklahoma before it was, um, uh, you know, erased. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's also important to see. Um, so finding these undiscovered stories, even the Black Panther Party, you know, had 10 principles for creating um, equality of healthcare, high healthcare, uh, quality education, um, for reparations, for against police brutality. And these you know, principles don't sound or seem necessarily radical now, right? Um, and I think that's also an example of finding how folks have shaped their purpose into the future um, decades ago too. And, I, and how do we amplify that now into the future? So that's really um, that connection where we're kind of amplifying our ancestral intelligence, again, the real AI and amplifying it into the future. Well, for wonderful. Sure. And, and if I understood correctly, that amplification is happening through co-creating or unearthing, as you said, those stories, the references to artwork, particularly in Afrofuturism. Oh, the yeah. Creation, the pluriverse. Are those kind of those artifacts or ways that all of us would be able to unearth and celebrate that ancestral intelligence that we all have in the social identities and communities that we operate in, but to try to bring those up to the surface so that we're able to create what we refer to in the book, almost a, a North Star, a North Star of more collective purpose. Yeah, I think the aesthetics of the future are really important, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about, um, you know, there was a great exhibition at the Schoenberg Center for Black Research in 2015 called Unveiling Visions, the Alchemy of the Black Imagination. And mm -hmm. it um, really showed the panoply of Afrofuturist art. And in fact, that's the what you're seeing behind me is by Menzel Bozeman, um, too, if I just go to the side a little bit. <laughs> um, and you know, that paved the way to create the Black Speculative Arts Movement, too, a celebration of the Black imagination as an annual festival conference. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, all of us can really find some ancestral thread where in the undiscovered stories of our peoples to amplify into the future, too. So um, I think that's really important to kind of um, see and dive deep into our histories and amplify mm -hmm. for the purpose of actually healing our collective and individual trauma and, and challenges of today um, to create what Jake Dunnigan and Stuart Candy have referred to as alternative memories of the future that imbue us with more purpose. So I think that's really important where, we, where you talk about neuroplasticity. How do we create the neuroplasticity of um, alternative memories of the future that really create these pro-social triggers, right? And I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Bob, I'm, I'm very curious, Bob, in, in your many years of experience, particularly creating stories from the future, how have you seen those stories bring people together to unearth their ancestral intelligence so that there is more of a convergence on what the future might be with more purpose? Yes, yes, exactly. And I, I, I just love this conversation, Lonnie. Thanks so much for bringing this. And what we're trying to do when we 
say what's your purpose in officing and offices is to ask the basic question, you know, what, what is your collective purpose? What's your individual purpose? And we have a historic opportunity now because of COVID, because of office shock, because of all this disruption that happened following office shock around racial justice, around war. I mean, there's disruption all around us that gives us a chance to restart. It gives us a chance to reimagine. It gives us a chance to do better in terms of how we work and how we live. So what we're doing is trying to encourage people to take this opportunity and ask deeper questions. And it's not binary, it's not an either or choice. It's where are you on that spectrum from your individual values to your collective purpose. And the history is so important and it can't be ignored, it should be built upon. So this is, to me, uh, the opportunity that Office Shock presents is a chance to, to reimagine. And it should always begin with purpose. And I think you're right, Lonnie, it should begin with our our historical, our ancestral stories, because our, our brains are wired for stories. And if they don't hear stories, they make them up. So what we're doing is giving people a framework for doing their own story making, and, and you're getting us started. I'm curious, Lonnie, in your work, have you seen in the last you know year or two with all of the shocks that we refer to collectively as office shock, more interest and amplification uh, and willingness to take that great opportunity, uh, as you mentioned, Bob. Um, I've yes, I mean I've seen it unfold in our in our virtual reality playverse um, called Afterville, where it's a town that takes place eight years in the future, and we've had um, like an indigenous uh, futurist filmmaker, Dustin uh, uh, Justin Deegan come and debut his films um, and sort of amplifying his indigenous um, ancestral past into the future. So it's really fascinating to see that, um, to see how he's like, he's, he's based in, I think it's the Dakotas. And so he's um, really looking at, you know, how, how does his educational institutions look through a native lens. And so he's reimagining them through tools like mid journey and uh, things of that sort. Um, and also creating new characters uh, through AI as well um, that can, you know, th there's a way they can actually make these AI companions um, speak to you and, uh, and create whole characters that are based on these you know, ancestral stories so that it amplifies your story making. And I think that's really, really fascinating and exciting um, because, you know, it, it's it's like you're creating a, 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 a baby, a character that grows to um, feed back and amplify what you're what you're excited about. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and, and in general, um, seeing indigenous futurist stories reclaim and revive cosmologies that have been erased over decades um, to come alive again uh, in the aesthetics of um, you know indigenous futurist art is really really exciting so there's and even in the book you know off a shock you have these wonderful images that you know talk about each chapter of the book and you know they have Afrofuturist and indigenous elements in there that are really fantastic too. So you know that's one of the things that draws to me from the, for the for the book is seeing those images accompany uh, the chapters. So um, I think that's really imp important. Um, there's another great Amazonian uh, futurist, or he does Amazo futurism called uh, Jao Quiros from Brazil, um, and chapters like, you know, the biggest growing chapter of the Black Speculative Arts Movement is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So really looking at that too. I think, you know, when we think about um, future signals, I think only get be become more important too. And I think um, maybe sometimes not enough attention is given to uh, art as a future signal. So I would mm -hmm. definitely call that out as as art as something that you know gives us all purpose you know a great song a great comic story a great graphic novel um a great artistic piece you know to inspire us 
to help us reimagine what yeah. the office is. Yes, and, and Joseph actually introduced this idea as we were writing with our co-author, Christine Bullen. Um, we, we reached out through Instagram to look for artists from all around the world who might help us reimagine uh, what this future, each spectrum of choice for the office, what those futures might look like. And um, again, we're not telling people what we think the story should be. We're inviting you to create your own stories. And your conversation is such a good beginning point for that, Lonnie. But the images in the book, to me, are one of the most powerful things to get people imagining their own their own stories. And may, maybe, Joseph, you can give a little background about this. This is really your idea that you got going. Well, it was really an opportunity for us to, number one, reach out to artists that are not represented in the mainstream art channels. But what we also wanted to do was to really say that we should all be thinking about what is the illustration of our future. And we believe, and that's why I wanna ask you yourself, Lonnie, we believe that that's, a, again, a very powerful way to be able to get out of that present forward thinking, the focus on the now, to be able to give everyone the opportunity to illustrate, well, what might your future look like? And we've been experimenting using AI uh, art generators in workshops, and it's incredible how the augmentation of our intelligence, referring to our spectrum of augmentation, how by augmenting our intelligence, augmenting creativity for many of us who have not been trained in the arts, the AR generator is a superpower and it enables everyone to be able to have the opportunity to illustrate that future and then be able to have a conversation with others because the conversation is the critical point, the point of the difference between those futures and to begin to reconcile them and to make some of the, uh, what we refer to in the book, those, those choices of what now those sometimes are challenging conversations, but we find that it's easier to have those when you're able to look at something. And so I'm really curious, Lonnie, again, going back to your current work and it is you know, could be in the, in the pluriverse or in uh, Afro rhythms, what are you seeing as being the stumbling blocks, the challenges to get people to either tap into their ancestral intelligence or just to be able to think future back, to be able to project 10 years out. What is the challenge that's, that's inhibiting them from doing that? And does opening with the question of purpose provide a spark to potentially overcome that challenge? Yeah, I think um, you know part of it is this act of having agency in unleashing your radical imagination you know, because we, we grow up with that um, kind of tamed in our educational systems. And how do we transform our educational systems to unleash people's radical imaginations? And so I think that's one of the challenges. But I think, you know, um, that's where, we, you know, I've, I helped co-direct um, and, and co-founded the Community Future School at the Museum of Children's Arts in Oakland. And uh, we take high school uh, students and, um, teach them about traditional methods of forecasting, about Afrofuturism, about queer futurism and indigenous futurism. So the idea is that they actually um, play our game, the Afro rhythms uh, for the future game and other games like the thing from the future and they create artifacts. And in these artifacts, they're doing a youth manifesto for what Oakland can look like in 2045. Wonderful. So, you know, so that's the challenge, and this this is the attempted uh, 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 solution. <laughs> and in that example, do you see a, a quick alignment on a more collective purpose? Um, yeah, you know, because once you unleash that, then they're also talking about um, issues in the present day, about, you know, principles of their charter schools that maybe they have challenges with, and they want to, uh, this generation seems to have a lot of activism in it um more so than i've seen before and they're they're like gung-ho to like do something uh about it so i do see how thinking about the future then turns a filter onto the present to see it in a slightly different manner to pivot 
And, you know, I, I'll never forget this one time where we have students lead what we call porch talks on different subjects. And they wanted to talk about their collective anxiety and mental challenges during COVID. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget where this peer group was playing, um, this high school peer group was playing the Afro Rhythm from the Futures game. And they actually um, wanted to support some of their fellows, fellow high school students who normally don't talk that much to really articulate their futures and imaginations. And I thought, wow, you know, this is where I saw a kind of collective healing in action as a purposeful um, um, goal. And I think that's like, where it gives me hope for the future to mm -hmm. see that happening and unfolding. You, you had mentioned earlier the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and in the book we use those as our <laughs> navigational stars, <laughs> that direction that we want to move forward to with clarity, but not with certainty, to be flexible about how we arrive at those uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. In your work, are you seeing the topic of sustainability or other wicked problems coming into the conversation and help galvanize particularly that younger generation towards activism or any kind of action? Yeah, very much so around um, climate change in terms of, you know, thinking of, um, you know, future inventions to heal the planet. Um, and also to heal ourselves. So we're very much talking about health futures in what we're doing too. So um, how do we address, um, you know, the the ideas of of equality um, and gender equality um, and mental health care too, um, so that folks are really becoming uh, in, more enthusiastic and engaged in 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 really sustaining their own mental health in order to face the challenges that we have too. So it's, you know, this kind of internal and external uh, dynamic of, uh, of addressing um, those challenges in growth areas. Bob, I'm really curious, uh, when we wrote the book, uh, you brought in Maslow, and then we also talked about a revised version of Maslow from uh, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman. And when I heard Lonnie talk about the importance of health and then such a powerful world healing, where do you see that fit into the those hierarchy of needs? Well, I, I, I think it really does happen in the purpose level. And, and we all have to, your health is the beginning of everything. So if you think future back, we're all going to have to figure out how to be physically, mentally, and even spiritually healthy, but just not necessarily religiously, but spiritually grounded in the face of this radically uncertain world. And, you know, getting your health right is the beginning of everything. So I, I think that's really critical. It was really interesting in this kind of updated version of Maslow that Kaufman did, Scott Perry Kaufman. Um, he, he challenges the traditional image of the hierarchy of needs, which was kind of a rigid pyramid, you know, that began with safety and health and and kind of topped out at self-actualization. What Kaufman says is, no, no, it's like a, a sailing ship on a rocky sea, <laughs> that it's, it's not a rigid pyramid. It's got to be constantly flexing. And I think purpose is like that. We've got to ground ourselves in purpose, but then we've got to express ourselves with what we call in the book, flexive intent, where, as Joseph was saying, the navigational star uh, but also the flexibility of pursuing that intent. So we all need great clarity of direction, but great flexibility of execution. And we do know uh, from the research done during COVID that purpose-driven people are happier, they're healthier, and they live longer. We know that purpose-driven organizations perform better. You know, so why not do it? This is, this is a historic opportunity to rethink our own health, our own purpose, our own meaning, uh, and and essentially do it better, create a better future for working and living. Yes, and as you mentioned earlier, Bob, that spectrum that we outlined in the book goes from individual to collective. So I'm curious, Moni, how in your practices do you see the navigating between those two ends of the spectrum? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really always excited when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, too, because um, he was really influenced by um, the, um, the Black Crow Native peoples. And in terms of, and, and their, their paradigm is that people come into the world self-actualized already as full human beings. And then they go to a shared collective uh, purpose. And, uh, um, and, and, and that's where they kind of end up as, as, as being totally socially actual, self-actualized. And so I really wonderful. love that. And I think um, that that's, you know, part of what needs to happen where, you know, we, we always talk about, um, you know, build yourself up by your, by your bootstraps. And, you know, there's a certain grain of truth in that, right? Um, you know, it's good to have individual purpose, but to also kind of see how it relates to a collective purpose as well is so important. And, you know, how do we dismantle some of these uh, myths that we've grown up with from white supremacy to extreme individualism to have a more shared collective purpose? And I think that's really important. Um, and in fact, that's part of why um, the Museum of Children's Arts is embarking on aiming to take high school students to um, Africa this summer, um, to Accra oh. in Ghana, and to really experience some of those ancestral stories um, of where the Black diaspora has come from, too. So, wow, powerful, powerful. And I guess as a step on that ladder towards, I uh, love what you said, that social uh, actualization. I'm curious, Bob, when we were writing, uh, you had always talked about there are going to be points in your lives where the individual purpose is going to be more important, more relevant. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so the, the purpose, um, this purpose question around offices and uh, the more popular question of when do you go back to the office, in-person offices really are better for certain things, particularly for young people. And what we know from the research is in person, maybe in offices, maybe somewhere else, but in person is better for orientation, trust building, renewal, early stage creativity, and culture building particularly for young people. So it doesn't mean you, you're in the office all the time, but having in-person experiences is so important in bonding and in mentoring and learning traditions and, and bringing innovation. Um, and, and I think th this is one of my concerns about the, the move to be increasingly virtual, which I think is the direction we're going. I think we're gonna have fewer physical office spaces they're going to be better designed to promote orientation and trust building and renewal, but also much more virtual in what we call the office first. So in that kind of world, I think it is a struggle for young people in particular uh, to learn cultures, to experience other ways of living. I, I, I think when you're young, it's a critical time to travel, to stay in other people's homes, to learn about other people's cultures. And, you know, if, you know, we call it the inter-pandemic period, if we continue to have this rolling risk of extreme pandemics, it's going to limit that for young people. And I'm concerned about that. So we need ways of using virtual media, in ways that help people develop their own purpose, learn their ancestral purposes, and also uh, figure out better ways of doing that, that they can express that purpose with, with great clarity and then, and then move toward it with great flexibility. So it's wonderful you've raised two of our other spectrums, the place and time. Uh, and also we've been talking a lot about the importance of having agility that flex of intent uh, to be able to make those choices and to find those opportunities, for example, to be able to explore, appreciate, and immerse oneself in other cultures, uh, to be able to learn more about, as you said, Lonnie, one's ancestral uh, intelligence. I'm curious, Lonnie, since we're talking about other spectrums, uh, are there two or three other spectrums that you believe are going to be really influenced by getting purpose, quote unquote, right. And when I put the quotes on, I'm saying right for a specific individual, a specific organization, and a specific community, that the 
purpose has been synchronized because there's always going to be differences. But assuming that that is done, that there is that level of synchronization or awareness, where do you think that it's going to be really important to get this, this why question right in order to be able to influence uh, any of the other spectrums? Yeah, I think, well, agility for sure, adaptability, um, you know, learning, uh, and also um, community. So community diversity is is going to be really important so that you aren't just kind of reinforcing your own stories, but hearing other stories. And I think, you know, the amplified um, diverse community is going to be the strongest. It's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's the one that's going to have really great psychological safety and, and at the same time have a, a, a plurality of, of views and perspectives on the world. And I think that's really important. Um, you so know, really getting, getting purpose right is going to influence what we refer to as the spectrum of belonging. Yeah, spectrum of belonging, exactly. So, um, and, you know, really those who have that kind of superpower of, of diverse community and will amplify belonging. And, you know, it's really about you, how do you find good company to keep <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and, and working through um, difference too. Yeah. So I think that's really key. Um, and, and I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder, Lonnie, you know, 1998 was when you first visited the Institute for the Future and you were just kind of a budding futurist. And can you tell us a little about your own personal story? You know, how did how did you get interested in the future? And, you know, and now you're a professional futurist, a global figure uh, 25 years later. But can you tell us the origin story there? What what got you interested in the future in the first place? Well, you know, um, in addition to my own varied ancestry of being Jewish, Ukrainian, Black, and Native American, um, I also had a visual disability, uh, too, at the time. And so for me, looking at things like Star Trek, um, I had Star Trek posters on my wall in high school. <laughs> and to see uh, folks like Lieutenant Uhura and Jordy, who had the visor, who was blinded in the Next Generation series, um, really inspired me to say, ah, you know, there, 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 technology is here to support us in amplifying our, our human superpowers, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's what really motivated me. Um, and in wanting to know, well, how does it all turn out <laughs> in thinking about the future? <laughs> Um, but, but also, um, knowing that I could be a, a part of it and add to it and shape it, you know, because a lot of times, you know, Ahmed and I will talk about Ahmed Best, who I work with, um, who was actually Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. Um, you know, we actually talk about, you know, a lot of times we're in the room and there's not a lot of people of color. And so, um, one of our purposes was how do we create more institutions that, represent us and include us. So I, I grew up in a really fantastic ecology of great science fiction stories in the 70s, but that did, didn't totally represent me. So I'm really excited about how do we create ecologies of the future that are really inclusive. So that's what got me into thinking about, you know, it was a, actually it was a, a Wired Magazine cover when Wired Magazine came out about talking about the future, um, where I worked with the Interval Research Corporation that was founded, co-founded, um, founded by Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. And then I heard about the Institute for the Future at a, at a winter party. And uh, I'll never forget one of the members of IFTF invited me to study them. And so, and then Kathy Vian opened the doors to becoming part of the uh, Technology Horizons team. And then I met you and I was like, wow, I'm actually in the story of my own future that I was envisioning. <laughs> nice. Fabulous, fabulous. So we are uh, at the uh, end of our time together. I think we could probably continue for at least another hour or two. Uh, I did want to give a shout out, uh, Lonnie, to connect with uh, Stephen uh, Lichty, who's working with Resilience Frontiers. They're working with integrating the 17 SDGs and building the foundation for futures work. So that I think will be an important connection to make afterwards. 
I really want to thank both you, Lonnie, and Bob as well for kicking off our deep dives in each of the spectrums of Office Shock. Next week, we'll be speaking with uh, the Institute for the Future Executive Director, Marina Gorbis, about the spectrum of outcomes. That spectrum, just to remind everyone, is between profit and prosperity, right behind the importance of purpose. So we're going to be continuing these over the next couple of weeks. Please do reach out to us if you want more information. You can always go to officeshock.org, which is where we have a number of links. We have the illustrations as well. Those are located on our website. Feel free to download those, share those. And we look forward to continuing this conversation, which is why we wrote the book, to trigger a conversation about how to turn office shock, all of the shocks that are happening now and are on the horizon into a great opportunity for better futures for working and living. Thank you again, Lonnie. Thank you again, Bob. Thank you all for joining and hope to see everyone again next week. Yes. Great to be here. Thank you all. Bye-bye.